Today, tsunamis kill thousands and wipe out everything in their path. Earthquakes destroy entire cities and towns. And hurricanes tear across the landscape, leaving hundreds dead and thousands more displaced. As long as the Earth has existed, there have been natural disasters. But are such disasters really capable of wiping out all traces of our existence, including art, architecture, and technology? Evidence suggests that it is not only possible, but that it has happened over and over again. It is quite possible that there are ancient civilizations destroyed in a big natural disaster and left no trace. What we had thought was a sort of smooth development from simple hunter-gatherers to very, very complex societies it seems not to be so smooth anymore. In recent years, scientists have found evidence of ancient and once thriving cultures, thousands of years older than any believed possible. But what happened to them? How did they disappear? And could it all happen again? The elements have taken a very heavy toll on people all over the world throughout history. This is the ultimate doom of humanity. Are we really destined to be wiped off the face of the Earth? And become just another civilization lost? The Rub Al Khali Desert, Oman. This forbidding and desolate terrain on the Arabian Peninsula has long been marked on maps as the Empty Quarter. Its shifting desert sands and scorching heat are home to little more than poisonous camel spiders, deadly carpet vipers, and roaming bands of Bedouin tribesmen. But ancient legends describe this area as a very different place. For it was here, approximately 5,000 years ago, there once existed a mythical kingdom called Ubar, famed for its riches and beauty, but supposedly destroyed by God for its wickedness and corruption. The way it's told in the Quran, in a number of different surahs, is that a big wind came up and then destroyed the city because they wouldn't conform to the word of God. In fact, prophets came and wanted to change them uh, so they would become righteous and they refused. And so the city and the civilization were destroyed. For centuries, historians and explorers had searched for proof of Ubar's existence. But it would take an unconventional combination of space-age technology and traditional archaeology to find evidence that Ubar might be something more than a myth. In 1983, amateur archaeologist Nicholas Clapp approached NASA with an unusual request that resulted in a joint expedition to the Arabian Peninsula. He had just recently read about the use of radar imaging to map subsurface rivers in Egypt, and he was wondering if this technology could perhaps be used to find a lost city if we knew approximately where it was. Carried aboard the Space Shuttle Columbia, the technology, called Space Imaging Radar, acted like an underground X-ray machine. First, images were recorded from space, then digitally manipulated to bring out subtle details not visible to the naked eye, including ancient riverbeds and caravan routes now buried in the sand. I never thought the lost city uh, was something you could discover from space. But they began to persist on and looking at features that they thought might be very interesting. One of the big advantages of satellite images is that you can see an entire region, so you get a context for features. 
This is a shuttle imaging radar image of a part of the southwestern desert of Egypt, part of the Sahara, which is now one of the driest places on Earth. This large feature here is actually a river uh, an ancient river channel that's as wide as the Nile, current Nile River Valley. You notice within that is a very small river channel running through here. And if we go to that site in the field, uh, it looks like this. Here I am standing in the middle of one of these radar rivers looking at a cut bank up above. And that actually got us a little bit excited because ancient people depended on the same things we do. You need access to water and transportation networks. So we were able to see the relationship of these different features. And we did, in fact, see tracks in the area. So it was a jumping off point in the search for Ubar. Satellite radar images of the Rub al Khali also showed ancient caravan trails converging on an area along the eastern edge of the empty quarter. We were using what was then a new technology for ordinary folks, the GPS system. And we used that in combination with the uh, helicopter navigation to find the road that we had found on the satellite images and follow it out into the desert. And that was extremely exciting. We said, well, let's land in this area that has this huge kind of a hill, and then uh, there's a water well below that or a spring. We landed there, and they said, well, uh, what do you think about this place? And I said, wow, look at this. You can actually see these structures. So that fulfills the first part of what an ancient place is going to have, made of stone, walls, and buildings, and that kind of thing, and lots of pottery all over the place. We then identified a number of places that were clearly uh, important even today, and one of those turned out to be the Ubar site. So you have to kind of envision hundreds and thousands of caravans with hundreds and thousands of camels and donkeys and so on carrying goods and materials to and from the coast through this particular location of ancient Ubar. This was really a trading post for assembly of camel caravans to go across the desert. There was, in fact, a fortress there, but the fortress actually just guarded the water supply, which was the way in which the camel caravans could be controlled. If you wanted to uh, go through the area, you had to pay your taxes. Further excavations at the site revealed evidence of eight towers linked by 30-foot walls. This matched the description of Ubar in the Quran as a city of lofty pillars. But if the legendary city really did exist, did it mean the other stories about Ubar were also true? Its destruction by sinking into the sands, for instance. According to scientists and geologists, it was the erosion of an aquifer beneath the city that caused Ubar to disappear. The archaeological evidence around the site seems to indicate that when the water supplies dwindled, the fortress collapsed into the sinkhole. And people left. Many of them died. It was the same strange fate that was depicted in the ancient legends. But could such a bizarre event really wipe out an entire population? Could it really destroy all traces of a culture, a language, a civilization? According to many modern-day archaeologists and historians, such a devastating consequence is not only possible, but all too probable. We don't even know much about relatively recent history if you go back two or three thousand, four or five thousand years. Once you get past the last ice age, and then maybe an ice age or two, everything has changed, even human civilizations, human organizations, human communities. They've just been lost. Earlier cultures, particularly ones that didn't have writing, are often largely forgotten. Yeah, there's no historical record, of course, and the only potential record is an archaeological one. So that requires that an archaeologist find whatever they left behind and then reconstructs their story from it. For decades, scientists have believed that human beings existed for approximately 200,000 years. 
and what we call civilization emerged only a few thousand years ago. But new discoveries are constantly challenging just how much of our own history we really know. The well, conventional view would say that you get civilization when you get the rise of the first cities and the first writing. And that is something which happens around 3,500 BC in Iraq, in Mesopotamia. This is when bands or groups of people transformed from hunter-gatherers into agrarian societies. That is, they could grow their own food. And once that happened, they were able to stay in one place. And it's at this settling down of humanity, if you will, that we begin to, to talk about the concept of civilization. We sort of know back to a certain point, maybe tens of thousands of years pretty well. We also know fairly well from evolutionary studies about when we would expect humans to be around. And that gap between getting humans and the civilizations we've studied a lot is pretty large. So it's an exciting thought of how far back does civilization really go. But if Ubar actually existed, how many other ancient cities lie buried, waiting to be discovered? And once discovered, what will we find? Perhaps evidence of our own ancient past? Or will we find clues to our future destruction? Şanlıurfa, Eastern Turkey, 1994. High on a rural hillside, a Kurdish farmer's plow came to an abrupt halt when he struck a large rectangular stone half buried in the dirt. For several days, he tried to dig out and remove the stubborn object. And then, something unexpected happened. The farmer began to find evidence of strange shapes carved into the stone. Before long, his discovery drew teams of international archaeologists to the site. And after careful excavation, a series of massive megalithic stones were revealed. And on them were incredibly well-preserved relief carvings of animals, including boars, foxes, cattle, and various birds, many not indigenous to the region. These are very, very beautifully executed drawings. I mean, some of the lions are really quite amazing. It's quite clear that it is an extraordinary site. But what was really astonishing was that the site, known as Gobekli Tepe, or the Hill of the Navel in Turkish, was estimated to be 11,000 years old nearly 5,000 years older than any comparable site. Gebekli Tepe is a game changer. What it means for archaeologists is that we just have to extend and expand our definition of civilization to include it. Gebekli Tepe took everyone by surprise. We've never seen anything like this. It shows the tremendous sophistication. This is an astonishing uh, discovery for such an early period. Tebekli Tepe is just extraordinary. These are 7,000 years older than the Great Pyramids. And people have said, how could the ancient Egyptians have had this technology, this understanding at such an early stage in humanity? But I'm afraid that we've now got to look at these ideas uh, in a completely new light because Gebekli Tepe was 7,000 years earlier. In recent years, radar imagery of the site has helped to reveal a massive complex featuring more than 20 large oval structures, each consisting of megalithic columns shaped like the letter T, along with four carved limestone pillars linked together by six-foot-high stone walls and placed in a circle ranging from 30 to 100 feet in diameter. Obviously, there's a huge amount of planning. There's foresight. There's the ability to mobilize labor and to actually keep it as a place that then became visited over a long period of time. 
The stones themselves, generally in weight, are between 15 and 20 tonnes apiece, although some of them would possibly be as much as 40 to 60 tonnes. The idea of the organisation behind this is just absolutely mind-blowing, basically. Quite clearly, you would have had to have literally hundreds, of, if not thousands, of people involved in this building project. But who built Gobekli Tepe? What purpose did it serve? Gobekli upsets the apple cart in the sense that what we had thought was a sort of smooth development from simple hunter-gatherers to very, very complex societies it seems not to be so smooth anymore. The excavator of the site, Claire Schmidt, believes that the site is a major regional center. He argues that because the site is a very, very impressive location, and when you go there, you feel you can see the world from it. Some archaeologists believe nomadic tribes of the Neolithic age traveled great distances to Gobekli Tepe in order to participate in ritual celebrations. Others believe the ruins to be those of a temple, or even a place of sacrifice. They are clearly coming together for some kind of religious ceremony. These things have to be sanctuaries or religious centers of some kind. They're not settlements. They're not burial places. They just seem to be ceremonial centers. Many researchers now believe that Gobekli Tepe was in use for nearly 2,000 years. But by 7,000 BC, the stone circles may have been intentionally buried and abandoned. But why? Why would you bury this incredible complex of at least 20 different structures, possibly uh, much more than that? My best possible explanation is that something had changed and they needed to move on, and the best way of doing that was simply to fill in the whole lot. People just don't abandon things. These sites are so sacred or important that when they abandon it, they fill it in and care for it in some way, uh, and then rebuild either on top or nearby or something like that. And Gobekli is like that. You have clear evidence that people were intentionally filling in the temples, whatever they are, before they moved on to another one. I think that something more profound was going on here. You've got to look at the time frame. We're at the very end of the last ice age, a time of huge transition. And there's evidence that there was some kind of catastrophe during this epoch, possibly being caused by either a comet or asteroid impact um, over the North American continent. And there is evidence of this all over the world. It was during this time frame that Gobekli Tepe was constructed. And we've got to ask ourselves why. And the answer seems to be that they had to do it. There was something going on. A global catastrophe caused by the impact of a comet or asteroid? Could this really be the answer to what forced the ancient inhabitants of Gobekli Tepe to abandon the site? Or was it the aftermath of a catastrophe that caused the site to be built in the first place as a temple or place of thanksgiving? Some researchers believe the answer can be found nearby, at Mount Ararat, which, according to the Hebrew Bible, is the place where Noah's Ark reportedly came to rest after the waters of the Great Flood receded. When we look at Mount Ararat, we find that this location is just a few hundred miles away from Gobekli Tepe. When we're looking at the animals which have been carved at Gobekli Tepe, we're at a loss to explain why some of these animals would have been incorporated in there. Quite a few of these animals do not really have a local significance. But the question is, did some of these animals live there at that moment in time? And then the question is, where did they come from? When we look into mythology, there is a ready-made answer. Could it be the animals of Noah's Ark? The origins of the flood stories have been studied a great deal. 
We find the stories everywhere on the planet. There is an Ojibwe Indian Native American version. There is a version in China. It shows up in Greek mythology. It shows up in Hindu mythology. It is entirely possible that real events inspire mythologies, legends. The flood stories may be about real floods. Do the myths and stories of a great flood and the rescue of various animals aboard an ark really have a basis in fact? Perhaps the answer can be found by examining other lost civilizations and what they might reveal about mankind's mysterious past and its uncertain future. December 26, 2004, Sumatra, Indonesia. A magnitude 9.1 undersea megathrust earthquake centered hundreds of miles out in the Indian Ocean triggered a devastating tsunami. Within minutes, more than 230,000 people die and more than 2 million were displaced. Seven years later, on March 11, 2011, a magnitude 9.0 earthquake rocked northeastern Japan, the most powerful earthquake ever to hit the island country. Minutes later, a 30-foot tsunami swept inland, washing away entire cities. and an estimated 23,000 people. But if modern cities, engineered to state-of-the-art disaster preparedness, can be virtually wiped away in a matter of minutes, might this have also been the fate of many ancient, now lost, civilizations? As long as the Earth has existed, there have been natural disasters. Tsunamis, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions. All of these have happened long before there were any humans to tell stories about them. Volcanoes are also notorious for wreaking havoc upon civilizations, and Pompeii is the perfect example of this. Vesuvius erupts, and an entire region is just frozen in time and destroyed. The cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum were in fact buried by the volcanic ash and pumice and also pyroclastic flows that reach the cities. Those cities were preserved, and it was over 1,500 years until uh, someone actually discovered uh, that the city was there. Unfortunately, no matter how sophisticated and technologically advanced a society is, a big natural disaster can either interrupt it and take it back decades or even finish it off completely. Heraklion, Crete. In 1894, British linguist and archaeologist Sir Arthur Evans came to this island in the Aegean Sea to translate several recently discovered clay tablets thought to be from an early Greek period. What Evans found, however, stunned historians around the world. The hieroglyphic script was not Greek, but that of an unknown civilization dating back to 5000 BC. Three years later, Evans led an expedition that would unearth what would become known as the Palace of Knossos. According to archaeologists, the massive structure once contained beautifully decorated rooms, hot and cold running water, and even indoor toilets. Evans named the people who built the palace the Minoans, after the mythological King Minos of Crete. The Minoan civilization was like the superpower of the Eastern Mediterranean in the Bronze Age. It had a huge fleet. It would trade with practically all the people in the Mediterranean. 
The Minoan civilization of Crete was a society that started to develop a series of quite elaborate palaces with courtyards for ceremonies and paintings and frescoes and quite elaborate architecture. The Minoans are now considered to have been the first great power in the Mediterranean. Their reign extended from about 2500 to around 1600 BC. But how could such a powerful and technologically advanced people simply disappear? Many researchers believe the answer can be found by examining one of the most massive volcanic eruptions in the history of civilization on the island of Thera, 70 miles north of Crete. The Theran eruption happened in uh, two or three phases over the period of a few days or a few weeks. What we think happened is that there was enough warning because in Thera itself, we haven't found skeletons like we have found in Pompeii and in other places. So people must have had the chance to leave Thera. But for the rest of the people, for example, in Crete, they really could not have expected that the eruption of the volcano would have affected them in the way that they did. In volcanology, we talk about different types of volcanic eruptions, from mild eruptions, mostly lava flows, to Plinian eruptions, and we also have ultra Plinian if they are very large. The eruption of Tira was a Plinian eruption, or maybe even ultra Plinian. It was very explosive. This incredibly explosive eruption just blew off a lot of the island. The sky darkens, the eruption cloud spreads across, it starts depositing ash, which is found as far away as places like Rhodes and southwestern Turkey. In other directions, the evidence of the eruption would have been the sounds of the explosions heard in the distance as the eruption proceeded. It is now widely believed that the violent volcanic eruption on Thera generated a massive tsunami that surged towards the port cities on Crete. What we have here is a model of the Aegean Sea in the Eastern Mediterranean and of the Thera volcano. So what we will see is what happened right after the eruption of the volcano. First, there is what we call a backfill wave as the caldera of the volcano collapses. It forms a void in the sea, and then the wave starts spreading out and moving towards the island of Crete, and it's exactly there where the Minoans used to live. So this is the initial wave, it starts spreading out. This is Crete, out here, and in about 20 to 25 minutes, the wave reaches Crete. The size of the wave when it reaches Crete varies anywhere between 15 to 30 feet. To understand what it must have been like for the Minoans, we can see what happened in Japan in March 2011. This huge tsunami. And we see daily the impact of the society. And sure, the Japanese may have pulled through it, but they were not alone. It was the entire world that was helping. Imagine the Minoans having absolutely no one to turn to. Is it possible for a civilization to have existed, to be wiped out, and then for another civilization to come along and not know that there had been a civilization there before? This is a fascinating theory, which leads to a lot of speculation and a lot of, you know, a lot of people want to talk about, you know, could there have been a civilization on Earth that predated all known civilizations that we just don't know about? If an active volcano really could wipe out virtually all traces of a past civilization, might similar volcanic activity pose the same danger even today? Volcano researchers say yes, and have raised concerns about the possibility of just such a catastrophe threatening the east coast of the United States. The island of La Palma near Tenerife in the Canary Islands 
has some faults, and it's thought that actually a large part of this island could just slide into the sea. And if it did, it could cause a massive tsunami. The collapse of a volcano in the Canary Islands, like the Cumbre Vieja in La Palma, can produce that sort of level of damage along 20,000 kilometers of coastline, all the way from Newfoundland and the east coast of the United States through the Caribbean to northern Brazil. What the models are saying is when the waves get to the east coast of the United States, they'll be round about 10 or 20 meters high. So that's the sort of wave heights that we saw in Sumatra in 2004 after the earthquake there, and that we've just seen in Japan after the 2011 earthquake. But could a natural disaster, such as a volcanic eruption, an earthquake, or a tsunami, actually destroy all traces of a civilization? Destroy it so thoroughly as to cause the history of mankind to be changed for centuries? Perhaps the evidence can be found in an ancient gravesite filled with gold, located in a coastal city on the Black Sea. Varna, Bulgaria. For centuries, this resort city on the Black Sea has attracted travelers and traders from across Europe and the Middle East. In the second century AD, Romans took advantage of the local hot springs by building an extensive series of public baths. But none of these visitors, nor even any locals, knew of the secret that lay buried far beneath the city. A secret that once revealed would change European history forever. Everything happened in the late autumn of uh, 1972. There was a plan uh, to do uh, some sort of building works in the industrial area of Varna, and uh, there are uh, excavating works uh, for electricity cable. An excavator, Rachel Marinov, was digging a four-foot-deep trench when he came across what he thought were old copper artifacts. Marinov took the items home for safekeeping. And after a couple of weeks, somebody from the village said to him, oh, it's, it's very interesting things that uh, you found there. And uh, the director of uh, the Museum of Daugopo went uh, to the house of his uh, worker. And uh, when he saw the, everything, uh, he was uh, absolutely shocked. The next day, archaeologists from the museum at Varna, including Alexander Minchev, returned to the construction site and were stunned by what they found. The first day we arrived on the site, we saw several gold pieces on the path, smashed by the souls of people who were going through. People from that factory were passing by over these kilograms of gold several times a day. Uh, nobody would believe that uh, such treasures are hidden under this plain field around here. Further excavations revealed that this undeveloped lot was actually the site of a long-forgotten cemetery. It contained more than 300 graves that archaeologists dated back to approximately 4500 BC. But arguably, more important than the ancient remains of Varna's former residence was shocking evidence of what was once an advanced and thriving civilization. Many graves with human remains were found, in which uh, the body uh, were laid in different positions, orientated mainly with the uh, head uh, to the north or northeast. And uh, they were buried there with their own ornaments and uh, with their own weapons. There are many objects like this which are really quite extraordinary. And to find all of them together in one cemetery, now this really shows that, uh, that there was something very, very important going on in the Varna area. Contained within the graves were more than 15,000 intricately designed artifacts 
including copper axes, jade, and significant amounts of gold jewelry. Grave 43 at Varna is a really special grave because it's one of the richest graves. And there's a male body aged between 45 and 50. Some of the objects are, are really amazing as well. And one of them is a gold penis sheath. And it's all about sexual potency, the power of the male, fertility. And so you have this on the one hand. And on the other hand, you have this political symbol, the gold mace. There's nothing quite like this combination of political and sexual symbolism uh, anywhere else in the world. Gold is, is very much a status marker. It's a rare material. It's flashy. It doesn't tarnish. It's durable. It has all these properties which make it a very good marker of social status and display. While archaeologists found gold objects in many of the graves, most of them were concentrated in just a few. The unexpected discovery of Varna shattered historians' perceptions of early Europeans. In the settlements that we know from one or two thousand years before Varna, there are objects, and often very beautiful objects, but not so many status objects, and there is not so much difference between households. You might be talking about eight really rich graves out of 300. So that's a significant concentration, I think. It was believed that uh, during prehistoric time, people were all equal. They worked together. They shared everything they could collect. And there was no difference, no social difference, nothing. They probably were like us. They were appreciating uh, gold or jewelry. They have all these very useful um, tools. So yes, they're nothing different from us. We, we, it is us. Evidence suggests that Varna served as a center for prehistoric traders transporting copper weapons to regions as far away as France and Spain. Nearly 1,500 years before similar centers of trade in Mesopotamia. Varna is also very well connected with armor, with warcraft uh, and battles, because in these graves we are finding a big number of uh, weapons. Battle axes, spearheads, arrowheads. It's clear to see that uh, the power is always connected with warcraft. Before Varna, of course, we knew about some really complex societies, uh, which now we know that they date to the Bronze Age. The discovery of Stonehenge, that also was thought to be one of these really complex societies. But Varna is at least 3,000 years earlier than Stonehenge. The development of civilization is a long story, and we thought that we had many of the signposts in Egypt, in Mesopotamia, in Crete, but Varna predates all of those. The dawn of European civilization started right on this site. Under this soil, for thousands of years, history kept uh, its secrets. I just can't imagine if what would have happened if we haven't found Varna and be having all these things just under our own feet. But what still remains a mystery is just how the population of Varna disappeared around 4100 BC. It has been proved that uh, sometime in the late fifth millennium, probably about 4200 BC, there was a very dramatic change of the climate. And because of this, the level of water arose and it was also connected with much more higher temperatures. And because of this, uh, the condition for agriculture became much worse than before. Could climate change, perhaps one that caused drought and famine, really be the cause of Varna's disappearance? Recently, archeological excavations at sites in the Middle East have been providing much new information. 
Many archaeologists and scholars believe that such discoveries will help solve the mystery of what actually happened to Varna and other lost cities. But there are those who point to different, more incredible evidence. Evidence of natural disasters and cataclysms of global and even nuclear proportions. Evidence that suggests our own time may be running out. Tel Hamukar, northeastern Syria, eight miles north of the Iraqi border. In early 2000, an archaeological team with the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago made a stunning announcement. They had uncovered the ruins of an unknown civilization dating back more than 6,000 years. The excavations revealed a once thriving city called Tel Hamukar, filled with what appeared to be lavish homes, prosperous businesses, and government buildings. It's big, it's about one kilometer by one kilometer square, which is probably enough to hold about 10,000 to 20,000 people, so a big town. When it was a thriving city, it almost certainly had writing. Public buildings have been excavated to only a limited degree, but it had a large wall around it, and it had major gates. So some of these elements of civilization have still to be recovered because uh, today it's underneath a modern village. So Hamakar demonstrates that our notion of cities, that is, with divisions of labor, with laws and, and legal systems, government structures, with artistic development and expression, may have taken place a lot earlier than we previously believed. The surprising discovery of Tel Hamukar upended what scholars had long held as fact, that the first actual ancient city had emerged in southern Mesopotamia, 400 miles further east in what is now Iraq. But if Tel Hamukar was such a large, thriving city, why did it suddenly disappear? Around 3500 BC or so, they had a bad day. Um, there, was, there was clearly a day when there was an attack. During this attack, the people of Hamakar were overcome, their city was destroyed, and when it came back, it came back more as a small village and never really recovered from that attack. Parts of this fourth millennium BC settlement was actually burnt down. And also, last count I saw is about a dozen skeletons. These were skeletons that were not formally buried, to my knowledge. The argument about warfare and the deliberate destruction of the site, the argument is compelling. Warfare at the time of Hamakar's destruction was mainly a hand-to-hand -hand combat kind of affair. But there is uh, evidence that possibly at Hamakar, people were actually using bullets. Now, not bullets from guns, obviously, but basically slingshots. Uh, this is a, a controversial idea put forth by the excavators at Hamakar. But there's no question that Hamakar was destroyed and that the, the fighting was fairly brutal and that Hamakar was put to the torch. What's interesting is that at that time, you had the cities of the south, like Uruk, that were developing. And we've known that for a long time. But there's new evidence that places like Hamakar were actually creating their own kind of civilization at the same time. So in a sense, you had a north versus south dynamic that was happening. So the destruction of Hamakar actually might be the death knell for these people in the north who were trying to create their own way of life, but eventually they were overcome by the people in the south, and that changed history. Several hundred miles west of Tel Hamakar lie the ruins of another ancient settlement, Tel Caramel. In 2007, archaeologists excavating ancient graves at the site uncovered the foundations of five large stone towers, each measuring 15 feet in diameter and suggesting a height of approximately 20 feet. They are thought to be at least 10,000 years old. 
They're located in northern Syria, not too far away from Gobekli Tepe, and it's pretty obvious that we're dealing with the same culture here. Now, why exactly they were constructed is a mystery. The most obvious answer is to suggest that they are defensive. And indeed, you know, there could have been predators, whether they be animal or human. Of course, the real question is, what were they used for? Was it actually part of a genuine fortification? Were they watchtowers or did they have some other um, purpose? It's not known, to be honest. Tel Karamel in northwestern Syria is an important site because it gives us our first evidence of permanent stone-built structures by a group of people that predated the previously known oldest permanent structures in the city of Jericho by about 2,000 years. What Caramel shows very, very clearly is that we really had to give up on the idea that there was one process of transformation into the Neolithic. I could list for you many other sort of sites where you have very sort of distinct local cultures that seem very, very elaborate in their own terms, but really quite different from each other. This is not, you know, one development. It's lots and lots of developments from which some then are more successful than others. Most scholars believe that Tel Karamel and Tel Hamukar were destroyed by invading armies from southern Mesopotamia. Conflict was really endemic in the ancient world. It's not just war, petty war, irrational war, but it was actually directed towards aggrandizing cities and capturing more territories, more subordinate cities, more people that you could tax. But could territorial warfare really be the only reason why these once great ancient cities were destroyed? Recently, another, infinitely more audacious theory has been proposed. Perhaps Tel Karamel and Tel Hamukar were the victims of a bizarre and spontaneous nuclear explosion. In 1972, scientists in Gabon, Africa, discovered evidence of just such a nuclear event deep inside a uranium mine. It was found because of our knowledge of the byproducts of nuclear reactors. By measuring the amount of products you have, we can actually date how old it is. And we can find that it's about two billion years old. There's the nuclear reactor in the sun that gives us life. But the question is, could it happen on the Earth Certainly by the 1950s, people had made predictions of what it would take to get a natural nuclear reactor somewhere in the Earth's crust or core. Uranium-235 is our main source for nuclear fission reactors, and it is actually quite common. It's actually more common than gold. So on the scale of large elements that might break apart, it's reasonably common and we can mine it. So if you want to have a nuclear reaction take place, the two main things you need there's enough density of uranium and then something to slow the neutrons down. One of the best sources to slow down neutrons and have a chain reaction occur is water. And in this particular area in West Africa, you have that right combination of just enough water, just enough uranium, dense enough uranium, you get a nuclear reactor. What you could have had with a natural reactor is a, is a disaster on the scale of uh, Chernobyl and a radiation release that, that could have affected people's health. A nuclear fission explosion, which is what would happen with uranium in a naturally occurring scenario, is certainly something you don't want to have happen. But again, it's typically underground. It would be a lot like a level of a volcano. And so it would be a natural disaster. Some scientists now believe that such a nuclear explosion could have wiped out all life for hundreds, if not thousands of miles around the site of the uranium deposit. And if it happened in West Africa, could it have happened elsewhere on Earth? Perhaps at Tel Hamukar? Knowing that it happened in one place at about two billion years ago, it's likely there were other pockets and places particularly deeper below the ground where we haven't looked carefully. I don't think many people have actually looked into the idea 
that there might have been some major natural catastrophe that caused civilizations to disappear. How many of them disappeared in the past that we don't even know about because maybe it was 20 or 30,000 years? What we are focused on now are civilizations of the past 5,000 years. Chinese history and Egyptian history is about all we go back to. Could prehistoric civilizations really have been destroyed by natural catastrophic explosions from places deep inside the Earth? Or is it possible that the mass destruction of ancient cities emanated from locations much... December 21st, 1968. NASA's Apollo 8 mission. Led by Commander Frank Borman, it was the first manned spacecraft to reach the moon. Completing 10 lunar orbits, the astronauts captured some of the best images ever seen of the lunar surface. The photographs showed the moon to be pockmarked with thousands of large craters, evidence that suggested to some that the moon had once been the site of violent volcanic activity. But modern evidence shows that there was another, perhaps much more significant reason for the moon's numerous craters. Massive asteroid impacts. Asteroids that may have also bombarded the Earth. That's not the man on the moon, those are the craters in the moon. And over the history of the moon and the history of the world, there's probably been many more objects that have hit the Earth than have hit the moon. Now, the only reason we don't know about them on the Earth is that we have vegetation and we've had an environment that has covered up and actually made them less detectable. The greatest natural disaster that could take place, um, that could wipe us out, is you know, a ball light impact, a meteorite falling on the Earth. We do know that meteorite impact was the one that essentially made the dinosaurs disappear. We're standing today on the edge of the Meteor Crater, a very famous meteorite impact site in northern Arizona. The crater was formed approximately 50,000 years ago when an asteroid approximately 150 feet in diameter came speeding through the atmosphere at about 26,000 miles per hour. It impacted the ground with a force equal to 1,000 Hiroshima bombs. After the impact, the crater was all that was left behind. And the crater, as it stands today, measures about 4,100 feet across, roughly two and a half miles in circumference, and about 550 feet in depth. That's equal to having the Washington Monument placed on the floor of the crater, and the top of the monument would be level with the surrounding rim of the crater itself. So if an event like this were to occur in a very heavily populated area, such as New York City, we estimate that the area of loss of life could be up to 10 miles. In June 2002, something happened that should have been a wake-up call to all of us. Uh, an asteroid about the size of a football field actually passed between the Earth and the Moon. It was about a third of the way to the Moon. We didn't even know it was there until after it was already past us. If it would have landed in the Pacific, it could have wiped out Southern California with a tsunami. Here we have something of such destructive power passing so close to the Earth, we didn't even know it was there until it was already past us. Uh, we can't let that type of danger a go unnoticed in the future. In 2005, NASA began charting the largest known asteroids in space that had the possibility of hitting the Earth. These are known as near-Earth objects. A near-Earth object is either a comet or an asteroid in near-Earth space. In, in the Earth's neighborhood, uh, technically, it's an object that can get within 28 million miles of the Earth's orbit. 
The sizes of these objects can range from the size of a golf ball to the size of a city block and, and well beyond. Although numerous baseball-sized meteors enter the Earth's atmosphere daily, they burn up in the upper atmosphere. Only asteroids of at least 30 meters in diameter actually have a chance of hitting our planet's surface. One of the most recent actual damaging impacts of an asteroid with the Earth took place on June 30th, 1908, over the Tunguska region of Russian Siberia. An object about 30 to 40 meters in size came into the Earth's atmosphere, and the pressure of the atmosphere on that small asteroid uh, on the front side was so much greater than the pressure on the back side that it pancakes and exploded about uh, four miles above the Earth's surface. It's leveled trees for 2,000 square kilometers. It's a very un inhabited region, so no one was injured, but uh, it did kill some reindeer, knocked over trees, and caused a great deal of damage. Uh, something on the order of five megatons of equivalent energy, which is roughly 385 times the energy of the Hiroshima event uh, at the end of World War II. Although the impact of any meteor the size of a football field would have a devastating effect, what scientists fear most are those that could be even larger. An asteroid that is a kilometer or two or larger, and there are about a thousand of them in near Earth space, would cause global consequences. Now, that's not the big problem. The big problem is the dust and debris that is thrown up into the Earth's atmosphere and shuts down much of the sunlight. You get uh, acid rain, you get firestorms as the, some of this debris rains back down on the Earth, causes global fires, and then the soot contributes to the dust and shuts down much of the photosynthesis that uh, is required for plant life and, of course, the animals that thrive on those plants. So it's, it's the secondary effects that are the real problem with an asteroid impact. When we're dealing with potential asteroids or, or or meteor strikes on this Earth. These are all candidates for things that could annihilate not only populations of living organisms, but entire civilizations, and have in the past. In recent years, the near-Earth object team at NASA has broadened its search to include objects more than 140 meters in diameter. One of these, an asteroid 300 meters wide named Apophis, is expected to circle close to Earth in 2029. Apophis is a large one. It was discovered back in 2003, and for a while it looked like it was going to actually hit the Earth. It had one in 37 chance of hitting the Earth in 2029, uh, but additional observations allowed us to rule out an impact in 2029. Mind you, it will come very close. It'll be a naked eye object to folks in Europe so you'll see this uh, asteroid going very closely past the Earth, but it won't hit. But while scientists have charted the course of Apophis, they cannot predict how the massive asteroid may be affected by other factors, such as Earth's gravity. The frightening part is that once it goes on, it will return seven years later. And we don't know if its trajectory will have been affected by the Earth's gravity, and thus it then might be on a path to hit the Earth. If it passes through a 600-meter-sized keyhole at the time of that close approach in 2029, it will come back and hit the Earth in 2036. Now, this is a big enough object that could create not the end of the planet, but it could cost hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives if it strikes in the wrong place. Unfortunately, scientists claim that it's not a question of if, but when a massive asteroid will collide with Earth. But when that happens, might all traces of our own civilization be lost? Could an asteroid have come down a giant rock out of space and created such a devastating effect in the ecosystem that everything died. It is possible to wipe out a complete species, complete known record of everything in existence.
Could this also help explain why other ancient civilizations were destroyed and nearly forgotten? But I think it's very possible that we had uh, earlier civilizations that in some way were wiped out by some near-Earth object coming down and uh, changing the whole nature of the planet. We're not chicken littles here, and uh, I know that's the way they think of us, is uh, we're chicken little saying the sky's falling. Well, the sky isn't falling, but there could be something up there that, that is heading in our direction. If our planet is hit by a meteor in our lifetime, are there steps that could be taken to minimize its devastation? Are we sufficiently prepared to avoid losing the centuries of technological advances mankind has made thus far? Or are we even more vulnerable than we believe? Mount Kilimanjaro, Tanzania. In the year 2000, paleoclimatologist Lonnie Thompson and a team of researchers drilled deep into a glacier covering the mountain's peak. There, they collected ice core samples that revealed evidence of climate conditions and changes, not just for the past few decades, but for tens of thousands of years. An ice core is a column of ice. We take a series of these from the surface to get the history of climate and the environment in uh, different parts of the world. These cores have very distinct annual layers, and where you can measure the thickness of those layers, you can measure how precipitation has changed through time. It records a history of the past composition of our atmosphere in the air bubbles, in the ice. Those are preserved. And so we now have histories going back over 800,000 years of looking at things like carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, you can even look at microorganisms that are trapped in the ice. We've actually resuscitated organisms that have been in the ice for over 50,000 years. So anything that's in the air gets archived in, in that ice. So what we're seeing is there are periods of calm, and then there are periods where there are cataclysms, and that this is the truth of living on planet Earth, that you bounce from one to the next. Stored here, in massive freezers at Ohio State University, are ice core samples Thompson has collected from glaciers all over the world. We have over 7,000 meters in the room right now. It's the world's only tropical collection of cores. We have cores there from Kilimanjaro. We have ice from the Franz Josef Land up in the Russian Arctic. We have quite a collection of ice uh, from the Himalayas and from Tibet. The oldest core ever drilled in a mountain region from far western China. It dates over 750,000 years in age. These ice cores on this rack came from the Bruce Plateau in the Antarctic Peninsula. These were drilled uh, this past year, and these will be cut and then processed in the lab. A recent study of the ice core samples suggests that a dramatic climate event occurred on Earth about 5,200 years ago. This sudden change coincided with a time when many new civilizations were emerging in Asia and the Middle East. It seems that all over the world, something new starts to happen. And one of my curiosities is why? Why does it happen then? And we, for 100,000 years, we were living perfectly happy lives as hunter-gatherers. And then suddenly things change. What is it that could cause that to happen? You have to look for some common denominator. And the thing that most likely would connect the agrarian societies is climate. We know that it's a time when the Sahara Desert dried up. Before 5,000 years ago, there were lakes uh, in that desert, people living out there. We know that because they left their artworks on the rocks. So a lot of evidence of something very dramatic happening uh, at that time. But 
If a global catastrophe did occur, what caused it? Could it have been a worldwide drought? Might a meteor have impacted the Earth and kicked up enough dust to block out the sun? Or was the cause a volcanic eruption? Volcanic eruptions are very important in terms of a planet. It's how a planet loses its primordial heat. So we have had volcanic eruptions on Earth for billions of years. Humans have only existed for a tiny fraction of that time. So volcanic eruptions have been here long before we are here. They are going to be here long after we are gone. They are uh, an essential part of what the Earth is. But while active volcanoes do exist around the world, most are too small to cause global devastation. Unless, of course, it is a super volcano. The idea simply is you have volcanoes that we consider normal. They release a certain amount of lava, a certain amount of energy, a certain amount of an explosion. If you have a volcano where the lava and gases have been particularly well sealed, it'll build up even extra pressure. And when it explodes, it'll be even more massive explosion. And that gets classified as a super volcano. There are volcanoes on Earth that are capable of very large eruptions. In general, the volcanoes around the Ring of Fire, the volcanoes that have calderas, such as some in New Zealand, or Papua New Guinea, or even in Alaska. Scientists have identified at least seven supervolcanoes around the world. The largest is located underneath Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming. The common thinking in geophysics about Yellowstone, and there are some other places on Earth like that, there is a concentration of heat at depth, which causes a region of partial melting of a rock, and that's very active. And the notion is that once in a while that can erupt in an absolutely major eruption. According to scientists, the most recent eruption in Yellowstone occurred approximately 600,000 years ago. When Yellowstone will do it again is completely unknown to us. We have no way of telling. It's sort of like predicting the weather or anything with geology. You're always going to have a fair amount of error in predicting when it's exactly going to happen. Yellowstone is a relatively young volcano. All the eruptions have happened in the last two and a half million years, and that's young in geologic times. If Yellowstone erupted again, a major cataclysmic eruption, it would be incredible. It would be something like we have not seen in historic times. Mount St. Helen would look like a little poof compared to what Yellowstone could do. It would have global effects on the climate. It would cool the Earth's average temperature. And uh, it would uh, just devastate the Western US. It would cover everything with ash, so agriculture would be lost. The effects would last for quite some time. It really would have a major effect on civilization. The ash and poisonous gases emitted in a major eruption could create a worldwide haze, blocking out sunlight for several years. In the darkness, the world's crops and animals would die leaving humans to starve. If Yellowstone exploded today in a big way, its impact on mankind would be much greater than it was in the past because there's so many more people. We are adding seven million people to world population every month. It's completely unprecedented. So we have vulnerabilities that we are not really ready for. Modern society is fragile in the same way as some of these large-scale ancient societies were. That's to say there are a lot of people around. We rely very heavily on intensive use of resources. And of course, we degrade these, these resources as we use them so intensively. 
So many people think we're in a classic collapse type situation. Humans are very much dependent on nature. We kind of forget that, I think, in the modern world, but there are forces out there that are much bigger than any of us. And those forces have been at work and they have impacted uh, cultures and uh, civilizations in the past. Global cataclysmic disasters may seem like science fiction, but believe it or not, many governments and businesses are preparing for just such an event. Unfortunately, one big question looms before them. Will their plans work? Scientists tell us that our planet has suffered several massive die-offs in the past. And during these events, the number of plant and animal species dwindled to just a few survivors. But if civilization as we know it suddenly came to an end, would all of our culture and technology really disappear? There are many examples in, in, in history where people of the past had technologies or had understandings that, that were lost. The more famous one, of course, is the Alexandria Library in Egypt. And with the destruction of that library in the first centuries of our era, tremendous knowledge of the ancients which had been accumulated was lost. And that was just not the lore of the Egyptians, of course. That was most of the classical world. What happens to a civilization if all of its collective knowledge is destroyed? We'll never know how great of a civilization we might be today because the library at Alexandria was destroyed. There was so much knowledge, specifically a lot of medical knowledge, that the Egyptians had that we no longer have. Have we probably recovered a lot of that or maybe rediscovered a lot of that? Probably. But how much more advanced would we be had we not lost that and had to wait around and rediscover some of these things? It is always possible that there were insights and, and pieces of knowledge from these early societies that are lost to us forever. Of course, we'll never know since we have no way of finding that out. As opposed to earlier eras where you know, a lot of the information was actually cast in stone, if you will. Our information and our records of our daily lives are cast in silicone memory chips. If those get wiped out, it'll be incredibly difficult in tens of thousands of years for people to reconstruct our lives, have an idea of how we live. Ironically, probably prehistoric rock art has a far better chance of surviving into the foreseeable future than a lot of our present-day modern technology. Hutchinson, Kansas. 650 feet below the city is a massive storage facility spanning the length of 35 football fields. In 1959, inside a salt mine, the Hutchinson Underground Vault was opened as a way to safely store sensitive government documents and assets during the Cold War. It's known as Forever Storage and is arguably the world's largest known time capsule. Underground is not always the best place to store valuables, but it does have some really important virtues. It's a very stable temperature, and many chemical reactions, decay reactions, are dependent on temperature and temperature fluctuations. Also, humidity is a really important role. If you can have a stable humidity, particularly if it's one that's not too low and not too high, uh, that acts as a wonderful preservative. This is one of the reasons museums are kept at stable temperatures and stable humidities. And one easy way to find those stable temperatures and humidities without using a great deal of energy is to go underground, and particularly in a place like a salt mine where there's a natural buffer from the action of the salt. For example, the animal skins that were used to create the Dead Sea Scrolls were washed in the salt of the Dead Sea, which acts as a natural preservative and prevents the animal skins from being degraded from microbes, which is one of the reasons we still have these materials today. Among the rare and valuable items stored in the facility 
are original copies of many popular films and television shows, as well as historically important photographs and documents. With a natural constant temperature of 68 degrees, the underground caverns provide near-perfect conditions for preservation. For any civilization, even for ours, if there's something you want to preserve, you want to bury it in a vault or put it in a cave where it's not exposed to the elements. Caves throughout southern Europe have been found to contain extremely well-preserved prehistoric paintings and drawings. The oldest and most elaborate of these were discovered in 1994 in France's Ardèche Valley. Scientists have dated the artwork inside Chauvet Cave to 30,000 BC. The cave is one of the greatest Ice Age decorated caves that we have. And it was astonishing. We'd never seen one of that size in that region before. It's incredibly rich. There's something like 400 something paintings and engravings of animals. Beautiful depictions of horses, rhinos, bears. Tremendous range of images. This was the most extraordinary images of animals which would look, not look out of place in modern galleries today. The age and quality of the paintings in Chauvet Cave have thrown into question everything previously known or believed about man's existence on this planet. They are regarded as the oldest works of art created by humans. The interesting thing about the Chauvet Caves is that we're dealing with homo sapiens that are attempting to represent abstract thoughts and ideas on cave walls long before the invention of writing and long before anybody's definition of a civilization. The question is, why are they doing this? Did these ancient artists create their art on stone walls deep in caves in order to protect it for future generations? 30,000 years from now, might the only traces of our own existence be what is stored safely underground? Something carved in stone, again, if it's in the right environment, will easily last, uh, again, thousands, if not potentially millions of years, especially if it's in a buried environment. On a remote Norwegian island, 800 miles south of the North Pole, and nearly 400 feet deep inside a sandstone mountain, sits the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. Its purpose is to provide a safety net against the accidental loss of the Earth's vast array of plants and food crops. More than 20 million seeds are now stored here. The seeds are stored in an abandoned coal mine that's been again turned into this very stable facility. Some seeds can last a very long period of time. Other seeds need to be planted and regrown and then harvested uh, as seed. So it's not a static environment. It's one where the seeds have to be constantly renewed and constantly exchanged with other seed banks around the world. I think the seed bank is designed expressly for a civilization-destroying event. I think it, it simply is a way of ensuring that if there's somebody's left, somebody will rebuild. And if somebody's going to rebuild, it would be great if they had this available to them. One of the unique things about being human is we tend to think about the past, we tend to think about the present, we also think about the future. We can imagine what we might want to pass on to our grandchildren. That's one of the motivations for all peoples. And so uh, burying something or putting something in a safe place for the future, I think is something even ancient peoples uh, may have thought about. If ancient civilizations deliberately preserved evidence of their advanced knowledge and technology in caves and other underground structures, might these hidden treasures help us solve the mystery of who we are and where we came from? And perhaps more importantly, tell us how much of our own civilization 
will survive in the future? Could we really vanish from the planet without a trace? Planet Earth, according to scientists, was formed approximately four and a half billion years ago. Yet most scholars believe that mankind has only existed during the past 200,000 years. But is it possible that these scholars are wrong? Could human civilizations have existed on Earth hundreds of millions of years ago, only to have the evidence lost, buried deep beneath our planet's surface? I think it's certainly true given that human prehistory is measured in millions of years, and we right now measure civilization in tens of thousands of years, that there is a gap of some type of civilization we could have easily missed. There's a great case to be made for the fact that there were civilizations far in the past that have simply gone away, that, that no trace exists. Go back a million years, go back a hundred million years. You're, you're still only some fraction of the way through Earth's lifespan. A hundred million years ago, there were dinosaurs walking the Earth. What if there had been some life form that preceded them a billion years in the past? There's really no way of knowing and no way of saying that, no, no, it never could have happened. If the Earth did suffer a global disaster, what might happen to the human race? What would happen if our entire civilization was wiped out by a giant volcanic eruption that made the entire atmosphere toxic and we all died? Would we have to learn how to cook with fire again? How long would that take us? The survivors are going to be those in the distant, far, sheltered regions. They're going to be hunter-gatherers again until the several thousands of years it would take them to, to rebuild civilizations. If past civilizations were indeed lost, is it possible that traces of today's modern society will also be buried under the earth and forgotten in time? If we look at Chernobyl, for example, and we see how quickly the modern construction there has deteriorated, and that traces there, again, in 50 years. A great deal of the infrastructure there has deteriorated significantly. If someone announced today, New York, everybody go away, abandon it. A thousand years from now, it would be buried under debris, under you know, water. Most of the buildings would have long since collapsed. Add another factor onto that, go 10,000 years. Uh, I can't imagine that anything would, would exist at all that anybody would recognize. You'd have to really know what you're looking for to find it. Perhaps among the few remnants of mankind's technology will be one of its most dangerous byproducts. Nuclear waste. The main danger from this is, of course, the radiation. The nice thing about radioactive materials is they naturally decay away and disappear. The problem is for many of them, we're talking either thousands, tens of thousands, up to millions of years. So you really need to design some sort of safe storage area that will hold them for a very long time. There is a lot of controversy about how to dispose of nuclear waste that comes from the creation of weapons and nuclear energy. They have to be disposed of somewhere on Earth. They were planning to bury it deep underground. It's called a geological solution to the nuclear waste problem. The US Department of Energy has hired a team of scholars to work with engineers at proposed nuclear waste storage sites. There, they hope to devise a universal warning sign that can be understood by future humans for at least 10,000 years. They need to devise a mythology that will caution people and warn them of the danger. Somehow they have to devise a tradition that will be perpetuated and passed along through generations and maintaining the warning, keeping the, the people safe from the nuclear waste. 
The current plan under consideration features a massive earthwork to surround the entire site. When completed, the berm will measure 33 feet high and 98 feet wide. The proposal also includes a series of granite markers, each standing 25 feet high and engraved with warnings in multiple languages. But can such a series of cryptic warning signs really be effective? Or will it be just as mysterious and inscrutable as the carvings of Gobekli Tepe or the megaliths at Stonehenge? You're not going to put a skull and crossbones on it. What is, what is that going to mean to somebody even 500 years from now? What kind of languages can you put on it? Like, don't dig here or go back. It is incredibly challenging. In the vast history of our planet, human activity makes up less than 1% of its four and a half billion year timeline. But are we really only a speck? A temporary resident? Doomed to be forgotten in another 100,000 years or less? I think we human beings are actually capable unfortunately, of wiping each other out. We could destroy the human race, but we can't destroy the Earth. The Earth was here a lot longer uh, than we've been and will be here a lot longer uh, than we will be. If every trace of our own civilization could be destroyed so easily, how can historians be certain that everything we are experiencing hasn't all happened before? We are pushing back the dates all the time. And I think that at some stage, evidence that probably is already with us is going to start making us realize that there could have been earlier civilizations. Something that we probably don't even recognize at this time. The date for the origin of things just keeps going back and back and back, whether it's pottery or settling down or the use of fire or whatever never fix on a date and say it can't have happened before that because inevitably evidence will arise that it did. The fact that civilizations probably evolved more than once and may have been wiped out by some, some event and then come back again uh, is, is, may provide some lessons for us today. And the fact of the matter is a true scholar will concede that the more information we have, the more we realize we really don't know about the world. When you think about it, the written records that we have from the deep past is so minimal that we basically know almost nothing. Is mankind's history really so mysterious? Or are there clues which still lie hidden, waiting to be discovered? When we find them, will we heed their possible warnings? Or will we ignore them and become yet another civilization lost?